Today, Dr. Emerson Lombardo serves on the Medical Scientific Advisory Committee for the Mass New Hampshire Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. She is also an adjunct research assistant professor of neurology at Boston University School of Medicine, where she is a faculty member of BU Alzheimer's Disease Center and a former recipient of an Alzheimer's Association grant to study a combination of nutritional supplements. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. Emerson Lombardo. That was a beautiful introduction. I just love being here in Rhode Island. First of all, you're lucky that you've got one of the best chapters in the country. And I'm lucky that I'm in Massachusetts where we have another great chapter serving uh, two other states in New England. The reason I'm especially thrilled to be here in Rhode Island, and I'm going to see if I can get rid of this little, not sure why this little thing is up there. Or what? It's gone. Oh, it's gone. Okay, good. Is that um, my, um, my in-laws uh, are from Rhode Island. They're both deceased now, but both my mother, Frances Emerson, and my mother-in-law, Anna Lombardo, both suffered from Alzheimer's disease. My mother had no other problems, no other health issues. She developed Alzheimer's in her early 50s and looked 25 years with it because she had no other issues. That's very unusual for someone that young. They usually don't live that long, but she had excellent care first at home with a home care aide and my dad, and then later 16 years in a nursing home and who treated her very well. And they knew nothing about what we know today and all the things that the chapter knows to help families and patients. We knew nothing about the lifestyle aspect either. My mother-in-law, she had other conditions. She had heart condition, she had depression, and she had um, some blood sugar issues. Um, I think she had diabetes by the end of her life. So she had, as you'll hear, some of the risk factors for getting Alzheimer's. She could have had a combination of vascular dementia and, um, and Alzheimer's. And I love both these women. They both taught me a lot about food, about cooking, about herbs and spices that you'll, you'll be hearing more about that because of my interests um, uh, stimulated by these two women. And then in addition to that, my two children both went to Brown University and loved it. So, so those are, and I have wonderful um, sister and brother-in-laws living in Rhode Island. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, I don't need to go into the disclosures because Donna told you all of them. And uh, learning outcomes you'll experience as we get along. And uh, so let me get into the facts of it. Many of you, because you're connected with the chapter, know um, these points about Alzheimer's statistics. <clears throat> and one of the ones I want to emphasize is that the prevalence of Alzheimer's doubles every five years after age 65. I will be talking about some of the risk factors for Alzheimer's in particular, but age is one of the ones that we can't change. You know, we can't stop aging. And 13, well, 13% 13 over age 65 have Alzheimer's. We believe that about 40% of those of us over age 85 have Alzheimer's or another dementia. So it's very, it's, it's out there kind of waiting for us if we survive um, other, other illnesses. And it's something that we all have an interest in trying to slow down and stop if we possibly can. We don't have any miracle drugs that allow us to do that yet. And that's why I'm invited to speak about lifestyle. Uh, <clears throat> right now, uh, we think we have $1.3 billion in research. This is a really small amount, but we're so happy that we're over the billion mark, which just happened last year. We still don't know whether the proposed 400 million extra actually uh, will make it into the budget this year. Uh, so pray for that. We really need every dollar. It costs anywhere from 25 to 50 million to do a lifestyle clinical trial. It's a little less for drug trials, but every clinical trial is very expensive. So you can see that money won't go very far. Uh, the reason I'm here is to share with you some of the knowledge that we have now about how the body um, and the brain are interconnected in terms of their health. 
and why nutrition is so important, as Donna gave you a preview. As you know, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and most other degenerative neurologic diseases are chronic. They don't just come and hit you all at once. They gr develop gradually over time. They're complex with many environmental and genetic factors. And as um, time goes on, we learn more and more about the complexity of the genes. And as you'll hear from other, other folks, uh, if you attend lectures, we're, getting, we're moving towards more um, individualized medicine. And we think this will happen eventually in the world of um, degenerative neurological diseases. I noticed um, that the, um, in the area of Parkinson's, there's a move to start trying to, decide, to decipher which folks have which gene complexes related to Parkinson's and see if they can come out with, with specialized medications for each of the subgroups. That may happen uh, within Alzheimer's as well because there is no one gene that's involved. So the chronic conditions that influence risk, I gave a little preview talking about my mother-in-law. The two main ones are cardiovascular disease and uh, what are called metabolic issues, full-blown diabetes, but also pre-diabetes or what we call insulin resistance, where the body is already starting to react to having too many carbs and too much sugar. And these, are, uh, these both um, are related to other destructive processes that by themselves, whatever their source, will increase risk and speed up the decline of people with Alzheimer's, inflammation and oxidative stress. And those two, those two realities are very closely related to what we eat, whether we exercise, and certain other things we do with our bodies. Um, I wish I had a, it's the only one I really need a pointer for, but you can see with this slide um, that it's a long process for developing Alzheimer's. We used to think we only used the term when somebody had full-blown dementia. This was like 30 years ago. And we could only tell if you had Alzheimer's through um, a brain autopsy. Now we can uh, pretty much determine it uh, through clinical interviews and some specialized brain imaging. But what we learned a few years ago is that the process actually starts two to three decades before you have any symptoms, let alone full-blown dementia. And as you can see from this slide, which is um, from other people in the Alzheimer's Association, the, the area where we can have most impact is prevention. When it's, we don't even, you wouldn't even, like if I had Alzheimer's inside me, I wouldn't have any symptoms at this point. This is when I can ha have the most impact of whether I change my lifestyle or if there was a medication available that I could stop it, stop it in its tracks or slow it down. By the time you've got some preclinical symptoms, like some mild memory issues and some other things, that's another really good time. It's not too late. You can, it's called early intervention. Then when you have full-blown clinical dementia and you've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease as a dementia, there's a things called treatment, but right now we don't have a treatment that can slow down the underlying disease. We can have, we have treatments that help alleviate some of the symptoms and help the person um, uh, behave and think uh, as, as if they did, you know, a couple of years earlier in the disease, but we can't slow down the underlying um, disease. Though some of the drugs being tested now in, at BU and Harvard and no doubt places here in Rhode Island are actually looking, can we un slow down the underlying pathology? But what we do know, as you'll be hearing, is that lifestyle, even at this stage, can help slow down the underlying pathology. That's what's exciting. Now, <clears throat> there are many lifestyles that there's now evidence for help in enhance your brain and help reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's and other brain issues. I've starred some of the ones you'll hear more about that are <clears throat> part of clinical trials either finished or are newly underway. Exercise, social engagement, keeping your mind active, and nutrition. The other areas of lifestyle, and these aren't exclusive, but these are the ones that I talk about a lot, is sleep. I mean, a good night's sleep is more and more challenging the older we get. So that's something worth really investigating if you're having sleep issues. You really need your sleep because during sleep, the brain actually washes itself. 
and helps remove some of the pathological proteins that um, are implicated in Alzheimer's, A beta in particular. So you need your sleep, you need deep sleep, not just napping um, during the day. And then um, creative arts and music, having a spiritual life and meaning and purpose in life. Well, there, the, while the evidence isn't as robust as in some of these other areas, they're also important for maintaining our brain health and our overall health. There's actually very good evidence uh, in these areas for our overall health with them directly or indirectly affects our brain health. Qi is something you don't hear a lot of speakers talk about. Um, it's part of Chinese medicine. I did the first study in the U.S. on acupuncture to treat Alzheimer patients. It was a little pilot study and it showed it relieved anxiety. So there's a lot about some of the other world's medicines that could be borrowed and, and very helpful to us. So that's why I include Qi. And managing stress and depression, we're appreciating that more and more as the years go on. And you'll see some of the studies around the world are working at adding management of depression to these other four highlighted areas. Because people who are very stressed have high levels of anxiety or depression, that it will increase your risk of um, Alzheimer's. Yes, and I hopefully my phone is shut off. <laughs> um, and then on the positive side, having uh, laughter in your life, and I know that this has um, been established also in other disease areas like, like, laughter, uh, like cancer management, um, is, a, is a very positive thing. It helps, it helps your, your whole body as well as the uh, chemicals in your brain. So what we'll be spending most of today, uh, tonight about was about nutrition, because that's my uh, field of expertise at this point. And why uh, brain foods? Well, one of our goals that we think we can manage just with the nutrition is delaying onset of Alzheimer's by five years. Uh, based on what I shared with you earlier, if we could, through lifestyle <clears throat> or any aspect of lifestyle, delay onset of, of the disease by five years, we actually cut the prevalence in half. So that's huge because our country is facing, as is the rest of the world, um, we, we're not sure how we would take care of all the Alzheimer patients we're going to have when the numbers double and triple and quadruple in the next uh, few decades. So uh, if delaying it or treating it, slowing it down is absolutely an economic and a national um, goal as well as it is for our personal sakes to not have it happen to as many of us as people that we love. The other thing that we want to do with brain foods is slow the progression of cognitive impairment once somebody has <coughs> developed an illness, whether somebody already has MCI or Alzheimer's, whether they're suffering from a stroke or other brain injuries and perhaps other dementias. And then, what, what's great about lifestyle is while you're working to protect the brain and slow down these underlying diseases, you're, you're not hurting the rest of the body, you're helping the rest of the body. Because as you'll see, some of the same foods you need to treat the heart, take care of the heart, prevent or treat diabetes, are great for the brain. And they also help um, lower your risk of cancer. There's only a few medical conditions where um, you might not be able to eat all the foods that I'll be recommending. And most medical conditions would not be recommending you eat the foods that I'll, I'll be mentioning are the most toxic to the brain. So that's good news. And uh, when has this been happening? Well, you're here, this is a really good turnout because you've been hearing about the importance of nutrition and other lifestyle, or otherwise you wouldn't have been so curious to be here. It's been going on, this research, in the world for the last 20 years and building up steam the last 10. So especially uh, in the last 10, we've seen more and more articles in magazines, newspapers, and on television. Um, we developed my memory preservation diet. It was called the diet before the nutrition program. Diet is kind of a negative term, so we learned to use the word nutrition in 2005. That's 12 years ago. and. Um, I want to honor uh, two, I worked with two medical doctors, uh, Dr. Lottie Volliser, who's now retired but still very active academically. He's over 80, he works in the Czech Republic half the year, 
and at the University of South Florida the other half of the year. You can imagine which half of the year we're talking about. He's still mentoring uh, doctoral students. Uh, he's, uh, he was at the time a full professor of EU of psychiatry, and his PhD is in pharmacology. And of all the, um, the uh, wonderful colleagues I had, he was really, really keen on everything and supporting everything I did in the area of lifestyle. And here's a pharmacologist. So when we decided, well, we weren't getting funded for our broader idea that's going to take a bunch of different lifestyle changes to really impact a, a, a really uh, problematic disease like Alzheimer's, we, we focused on, decided to focus on nutrition. And it was partly his guidance, being a pharmacologist, he believed in the power of food even more than in the power of drugs. And he was the leading um, clinical trial researcher for the whole VA system at the time he was um, a professor at BU. So, um, and then the other physician was a um, neuroscientist from Spain. He's back in Spain. His mother had Alzheimer's and he, he needed to return home. But um, the fourth person who's on my publication uh, she was a retired um, physics professor from Beijing, China, and she's the one that shared with me when she heard I was interested in Alzheimer's and I was doing my acupuncture study. She laid out a whole pro program of lifestyle that she thought, based on the Chinese literature, would help lower the risk of Alzheimer's. And this was at the time we were just learning that chronic diseases like stroke and heart disease were increasing people's risk of getting Alzheimer's. This was 20 years ago. And so I started looking at the literature and realized, wow, she's right. There was just the very beginnings of, of indication. And so I honor her. And I, as you'll see, we now have a lifestyle trial going on in China. So I feel it's, that's why I'm mentioning her name, Xu Wenzang, because it's come full, full circle. That it did take 20 years. And uh, in, in our country, it took a long time, despite <clears throat> all the uh, good, effective advocacy efforts of the Alzheimer's Association, to get our leaders to really take hold of this disease and take it seriously. Other countries were way ahead of us. But finally, in 2012, we did get a national advocacy plan The President uh, Obama got behind it. So um, meanwhile, in Europe, they would already had three major prevention trials. They were already collaborating. We had the first broad diet randomized clinical trial proving that it improves cognition in 2013. I'll share more of that information. And the International, Alzheimer's Disease International, released our first nutrition and dementia report in 2014. So you can see this is all very new. The Finnish Lifestyle Trial announced positive results for cognition in 2014. And at our AAIC is the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. We were able to show that nutrition and exercise slows down the underlying Alzheimer pathology, which helps explain why we're seeing positive results for lifestyle trials. So a lot's been going on, and you can see it's very recent. Now, I'm sharing three slides that just arrived from our National Association uh, at 3.20 this afternoon before I drove here. I was actually in my car when I got the email, so I ran back in and, and inserted these slides. So as I mentioned, there are other risk factors, and I think this slide uh, shows you a lot. They're all, these are all the risk factors re related to dementia. So in addition to the ones I mentioned, traumatic brain injury, which can, as you've learned, lead to a uh, different kind of dementia, chronic um, traumatic encephalopathy that my colleagues at BU are doing great research on, midlife obesity, midlife hypertension, hypertension <coughs> current smoking, those are all related to um, heart disease and, di and diabetes, history of depression, sleep disturbances, and hyperlipidemia, it's having too much fat. And then um, decreasing risk, and you'll, you heard some of this from me already, um, but I haven't mentioned years of formal education. So I feel good having a PhD, <laughs> given that I have some other risk factors. And notice that one of the, but both this slide mentions and, and myself and the clinical trials that are underway, focus on social engagement. So the fact that you're here is actually good for your brain. And while a lot of people um, spend time with puzzles 
and um, online cognitive training, it turns out, even though that's, that's sometimes helpful, it's actually you're having a conversation with somebody, especially someone you just met, or doing something new uh, with another person. If you exercise, exercise with a group or with another person. Anything you do, try to make it a two-for by involving another person. And uh, it's huge, and you'll see um, in the next slide what's happening here uh, in the U.S. starting uh, next year. Um, we now have, and this is the first time, the NIH never got around to funding a multi-domain multi clinical trial. So our own National Alzheimer's Association, and I'm so thrilled to be sharing this with you, has, has raised $20 million, which is a huge amount. Usually there are research trials they're putting one, one million or a half a million, a small, much smaller amount towards. This is 20 million, and it's not even the full cost of the trial. Uh, and it's, they're calling it protecting brain health through lifestyle intervention to reduce Alzheimer's. This is a brand new slide, so I think there's some kinks in it. $20 million, it's gonna be a two-year intervention trial. It's gonna be randomized um, clinical trial, and it's gonna have a lifestyle recipe. And these are the areas that they're focusing on, and you'll see where they got this from. This actually is the same program that Finland successfully did, uh, couple, uh, finished, um, finished their study uh, three years ago in Australia, just um, kicked theirs off as a, as a online trial. Um, this, well, I think it was this month. A physical exercise, nutritional counseling and modification, because it's hard to change what you eat cognitive and social stimulation, and um, they actually put those two together. The others separated them as two separate interventions. Um, and then improved self-management of health status. That's also uh, taking a page from the Finland study. Because since we know heart, your state of your heart health and whether you uh, have diabetes that is properly managed, are really critical to your brain health. And I think as we go along, we're gonna find out what role the liver plays, the kidneys, the lungs, uh, because it's really a full body disease. It's not just in the brain. That's one thing we're beginning to discover. So um, they're going to go all out with each of these, these first two are, as you see, we have supervised aerobic exercise, uh, dietary counseling, and um, they're going to be using the MIND diet, which I'll tell you more about that. That's the one that Martha Claire Morris developed. It's under clinical trial right now here in Massachusetts and in Chicago. And um, then they're going to use a computer-based cognitive training and group counseling to facilitate increased cognitive social engagement. I think they, they put the four reduced it to four and said it's really five-part intervention because it fits easier on one slide, <laughs> I'm sorry. The first one had a separate, um, separate little um, logos for the cognition, cognitive stimulation and the social engagement. So um, as I mentioned, they're going to make sure you've got proper uh, medical management. And the question of the study will be, does this prevent or delay cognitive decline? <coughs> and furthermore, um, prevent or delay or lower your risk of getting full-blown Alzheimer's disease. And what's exciting is that there is now um, a worldwide collaborative effort. This was just announced this summer at the uh, International Conference, which was held in London. And FINGER is the name of the study out of Finland. The F stands for Finland, and the G is for geriatric. And then. The U.S. study was just announced also in July. The U.K. Uh, announced theirs this year. China is the newest member of the group. Singer stands for, it's in Singapore, which is a city-state, but they're doing their own clinical trial. I think it's cute they call it Singer. And then the Australia study was funded by the Australian. Most of the other studies are funded by people, the country's um, Department of Public Health. It's coming out of... Uh, government funds. We're the only one where our government didn't give us the money to do it. So as I say, I'm really glad our association. So if you aren't already supporting the research effort of our association, please, this is really important. <clears throat> and what's really cool is that they're going to be inter, they're, they're um, doing that as a collaboration. It's, this slide has too much information on it, but basically 
They're all agreed about the four main interventions that I shared with you. Some of them are adding the medical intervention. In Australia, they're adding de treatment of depression because the, the colleague there, he's the other co-founder of uh, Alzheimer's Disease International. He and I are the only two still, um, well, others are alive, but we're the only two still active. And he's a geriatric psychiatrist, so naturally he's really concerned about depression. And a lot of us, by the way, in this field, we had a relatives with Alzheimer's. That makes us extra passionate, I think. And they also recognize that one size doesn't fit all. So each country, uh, we're still not certain, like, which is the best nutrition program. Uh, we talked a lot about different possibilities. We're not sure what exactly is the best exercise program, that we're getting closer to that. Aerobics are really important in strength training. And so each country might have a little different uh, tweaking of the intervention. Um, and they're using new technology. And the, the important thing, all these researchers are sharing experiences and data so we can learn from each other. And um, they're also, that's what harmonization of methods, harmonization is a popular term in the other parts of the world. And then they're all pragmatic. There, there are things that people like yourselves could actually think about doing. Um, and in Australia, they realized it's very expensive to have intensive counseling. So they decided they would, um, instead of having an intensive intervention for 600 people, they're doing an online program and recruiting 20,000. So even if, and their right thought is, on the pragmatic side, let's say out of the 20,000, they're all characterized people that are in one study or another in Australia already, and they have high risk of getting Alzheimer's for one reason or another. Uh, not high risk, but higher than average. And they figure even if only 5 or 10, 10% of those recruited to the study um, actually follow the online suggestions for how to change their lifestyle, um, if that is enough to make a difference in reducing those people's risk, well then any government could afford to do that. Not every government could afford to give you, you, and you your own nutritionist counseling and your own personal trainer. But any government, especially sharing, um, sharing the information, maybe some translation would be needed across the world, well, anybody could do it. So that's what they're thinking in Australia. Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to focus more on nutrition, and this shows you how uh, theoretically my program was developed. As for um, the other diet, some of the other diets that are more scientifically based were developed. Basically, I looked at all the evidence and um, extracted what, what was relevant and put it together into a uh, nutrition program. And um, what I'm going to share with you now is the research support it's not just for my program, it's for brain healthy nutrition in general. And then I'm going to go into giving you a comparison of some of the most popular brain healthy programs um, that we're researching right now. So there, first, some of the studies look at a single food or nutrient. And by the way, even though the pasta might not have been the best thing, if it had been whole wheat, but how, how do you get a hotel to sell, you know, serve you whole wheat? But I want to say in the antipasta area, we had olives, we had um, artichokes, we had um, some nice vegetables of all different kinds, and I think there was, it was uh, some really interesting, I think there were mushrooms and some, maybe some eggplant. So there was a lot of healthy vegetables over here. As you'll be hearing, there were a few things that weren't so healthy, even though they're absolutely delicious, like all those processed Italian cold cuts that we all love, right? <laughs> but they're really um, dangerous. So, anyway. Um, so we look at individual foods and nutrients, which would help us, which would hinder us. Those are separate studies. Some they use mice, and sometimes they're actually tested in uh, clinical trials with human. Um, there are some lab studies in addition. Mice are the most popular animal used in uh, Alzheimer's research, but there have been flies and flatworms and even beagle dogs. Beagle dogs, they, the researchers doing those studies claim, are much more like us humans than the rodents that are studied, and they're probably right, because they have a social aspect. 
Um, <clears throat> then there, there's been over 100 what we call longitudinal or cohort studies. That's where, let's say there are 100, and, I don't know how many here, 120, 140. Uh, so if they were interviewing each of us once a year, are any of you in studies where you go once a year to be interviewed? Thank you, thank you. So they, they talk to you about, um, some, of, some of the studies would interview you about your lifestyle, including what you eat, and be quite detailed. And then over the year, and they would do um, cognitive testing. And then over the years, uh, they could tell whether your lifestyle um, and, and the types of food you ate had seemed to have anything to do with your risk of getting cognitive problems or um, Alzheimer's or other neurological diseases down the road. It might be 5, 10, 20, 25 years before we could start seeing that. But anybody participating in these studies are hugely important because they help us identify what are the likely culprits. They won't prove anything, but they'll give us a strong hint. Where you get the proof then is you look at mechanisms through my studies, and you also then do your clinical trials in humans to see when you actually have a baseline, and then you have some people changing what they're doing and others not. And then you see, you compare the results. So the clinical trials, we say, are the gold standard for proving that something made a difference. And you have to have enough people in the trial. Um, this is where it gets expensive. And good testing to make sure uh, that your results are solid. And then what we are finding is that single, all these studies on the individual foods and individual nutrients weren't enough because that's not the way humans eat. And maybe no one single food, no matter how great for our brains, would be enough to turn around this really deadly disease. So what we learned is combinations of foods. You need that to have enough potency to actually start turning things around. <coughs> foods help each other um, to be healthier. It's called synergy. Well, I've got to move along. Poor diet increases Alzheimer's risk in the decline rate. This is where some of the earlier studies. So what we saw there, whether they were uh, studies in France or Japan, is that when you had a poor diet, you had higher risk of getting Alzheimer's and a faster rate of decline. I'm going to be going through the next set of slides kind of fast. This is uh, where the first studies came to show us that a combination of foods were more potent than a single food came out of um, the Alzheimer's Disease Center at uh, Columbia. And there was a Greek doctor who was at Columbia at the time, and he uh, naturally grew up in Greece, and he believed that the Mediterranean-style diet was going to be a brain-healthy diet because of um, its good effect on the heart and uh, diabetes. But how to test it, because he's in, now he's in New York State City, and their um, catchment area where the type of people that were in their trial, very few of them were from the Mediterranean. They were from the Dominican Republic and from other Caribbean islands. There were a lot of African Americans, and there were Europeans <laughs> from everywhere. So um, what he did, and it really changed the world of nutrition uh, and brain science, he came up with a point system. So you got a point for drinking red wine, you got a point for eating lots of vegetables. You got a point for eating less meat, especially red, <coughs> eating less red meat um, than most people. And you got a point for eating beans and lentils. Another point for eating nuts. And so we came up with nine points, and he was able to show if you were a close adherent. Now you're not Mediterranean, but you're eating sort of like the foods typical of a Mediterranean diet. If you scored six to nine, you had a 40% lower risk of getting Alzheimer's. That was huge. So that, like, rocked the world. Now, again, this is a cohort study. It's not a clinical trial. But it made people pay attention. Wow, we could really, well, you might get a small reduction with a single food that was good for you, like fish. Fish was one of the things you got points for. If you put it together, you could really have an impact. And he looked to see, um, in his study, whether any particular food stood out, and no, it was a combination. And um, part of that was having low intakes of high-fat animal foods, um, as well as uh, low intake of saturated fats and omega-6s, which I'll tell you more about. Now, once that idea was out there, then other researchers who had access to cohort studies, again, the studies would interview a lot of people with cognitive results, 
created a point system for their diet. So one diet that's been around is called the DASH diet. It's one that some people follow to lower blood pressure, high blood pressure. It's, um, so they found that it also lowered the risk of dementia. And then meanwhile, back to Columbia, they had in their study over time, some people, about 200 people had developed Alzheimer's, so they wanted to see well, what impact on the people with Alzheimer's in their study did following a better diet have? And they found, um, rather dramatically, if you had close adherence scoring six to nine points, you lived four years longer than those who had a poor adherence. And if you were in the middle range of what you ate, you still extended your life by over a year. Now, at the time they did that study, 10 years ago, um, they didn't have enough people to see, to be able to tell us, well, were these folks also um, living better as well as living longer? Anecdotally, that's what they were finding. Um, and then, um, we finally have a clinical trial to confirm the power of nutrition uh, for brain health in older adults. These are the, in the beginning, they were looking at single, single um, elements like B vitamins and fish oil. Uh, there were mixed results because they were just single nutrients. So B vitamins is a collect, was a collection of B vitamins. So when you think about it, this is like a complicated disease. How would you find, figure, well, B vitamins are all really good for a brain, and I will be urging you to make sure you get your B vitamins. It's not enough to turn it around. And then we, uh, there were some pilot uh, clinical trials with certain herbs and spices were very promising for people with early Alzheimer's. I'll share those with you. And then we found that high glycemic index foods are bad for brain and memory. And then we had the first whole foods dietary trial reporting a couple of years ago in the Finnish um, trial that I mentioned reporting in 2014. So let's look at some of these. Now, <clears throat> these uh, trials with spices and herbs, again, if our country was more focused on food and things that are available to everybody, they would be funding um, the, these kind of studies with not an N of 40, but an N of 1,000 or 2,000. This was all done in a small country that we don't think well of, but they have excellent researchers there. Um, uh, sage, so the, the spices they looked at were sage, and look at the name of that spice, sage. It's always thought that it helps you with your thinking. Melissa or lemon balm. I grow it goes wild in my garden. Now I know why. I'm trying to get my attention. And then saffron. And these are all tiny trials, but they were randomized. And they um, the first two were with a placebo, and they found that they did improve um, acetylcholine levels in the patients and their cognition. Uh, at the time they were doing these trials, the only drugs available were like Aricet and the like. Now, uh, when they looked at saffron, they actually did a head-to-head -head trial with Aricet, and they found that 30 milligrams of saffron tied with 10 milligrams of Aricet, the usual dose, in terms of the positive effects with no side effects. Now, you, you might know that some people cannot take the Aricet-type drugs because they have um, gastrointestinal problems that they can't overcome. So now you think, well, saffron, that's an expensive herb, right? Um, how could we afford it? Well, it actually, I looked up at the wholesale rate, saffron actually, the amount used cost half the amount of the Aricet. Now, would an insurance company cover it? <laughs> Probably not. But again, why isn't somebody doing uh, more trials with this? These were all reported in very top-level nutritional clinical journals. A colleague of mine who founded the Alzheimer's Association in Greece, Dr. Zalaki, is actually now looking at saffron. Um, now, in this country, and by the way, you're probably curious, well, what country was that? It was Iran. So maybe that's one reason you don't hear about it, but this guy was really respected in the field. And why, why aren't we funding those kind of studies? Aloe vera is the, um, the one herb that's been looked at in the United States. Uh, there are some smaller studies also looking at um, turmeric. Aloe vera improves cognition in Alzheimer's and lowered inflammation. These are just like the other. These are not uh, prevention trials. These are people who already have been diagnosed with dementia due to Alzheimer's. And they were able to show it improved cognition and lowered inflammation. 
another tiny pilot study, and hopefully they will be, um, you know, by now or engaged in a larger clinical trial. Um, aloe vera, you pay attention to that because what we didn't know before these people did this work um, is aloe vera can get in past the blood-brain barrier. It's already used, you may not know this, to treat ulcers and other inflammation disorders of the stomach because you drink it and it, it causes, um, uh, decreases inflammation inside you. You know what it does for a sunburn. If you've got red, that's inflammation. It calms the inflammation. So aloe vera, um, I'd say pay attention to that one. Um, so again, um, and then mice trials have shown multiple brain benefits of all sorts of different uh, spices. Basically, spices are important because they're powerful antioxidants and they're highly anti-inflammatory. You don't need much to have a big impact. So really, what we know about it is really limited by which researchers happen to take an interest and in, in get the money and do the research. So um, I recommend in general, this is one of your take home messages, spice up your life to power your brain. And there's lots of ways this helps. Uh, I've just shared um, a lot of it. And one, <clears throat> one thing that um, amuses me is uh, we did have one hot pepper over there with, uh, <laughs> with uh, Parmesan cheese, uh, or provolone, I think. And unfortunately, it had a very delicious processed meat in there. <laughs> but the hot pepper, the hotter the pepper, the more anti-inflammatory the effect inside your body. So if you love hot peppers, eat away. If you don't, well, there's other ways you can um, help yourself. Now, <clears throat> now I'm getting into um, what's actually uh, the biggest takeaway take message is you've got to really watch your intake of sugar. Um, this study, uh, there were two Suzannes that are big in the Alzheimer um, world related to diabetes. One is right here. And um, I think she's at Brown, Suzanne De La Monte. Maybe some of you have heard her speak. She's the one that coined Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. She wrote a really persuasive research article maybe 10 years ago now. And then Suzanne Kraft is a doctor in uh, Wake Forest. She was at University of Washington. And she's been looking at the connection between what happens to blood sugar in our bodies and brains and our risk of brain problems uh, like Alzheimer's and the buildup of A-beta, one of the two problem pathological proteins. So in this clinical trial, it was again a small one, 50 people. She contrasted a bad diet, a really bad diet with a better diet. Um, so she combined both high glycemic foods with high saturated fat foods. In one, half the people got that which you couldn't run for longer than 30 days because it really could start hurting somebody. And then the contrast was low glycemic and low saturated fat. And she found some of these people had MCI to begin with, some were cognitively normal older adults. And in both cases, those on the bad diet, she could show dramatic decreases in their memory with a certain test that she used. And she could see that the amount of A beta in their spinal fluid went in the wrong direction. So that was really dramatic, saying really pay attention to especially sugar, but also um, too much saturated fat. And then um, in uh, two years ago, we had our first gold standard randomized clinical trial reporting to prove that a healthier diet improves thinking and memory. I won't go into all the details here. If you want some of the details, there's an article the article that was a handout goes into this, but basically this was a huge trial with 7,500 people run in Spain, and it was mainly to see if following a more closely a Mediterranean style diet, now this is Spain, you know, this is their native diet, uh, would help uh, reduce first time strokes and heart attacks, and people had all the risk factors for heart attacks and stroke. And then along the way, they realized, oh, we should have added a cognitive measure as well. They only could do that for 500 people. Um, but what they found is not only did it reduce the risk of first-time heart attacks and stroke by 30%, and these are people that were on every medication they could have. A lot of them had high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. They had lots of things going on, lots of meds, but changing their diet made that additional huge difference. And at the same time, 
um, it improved their thinking. Now, um, I can't go into the details, but the major changes in what people ate were, first of all, the, the free food they were given. 2,500 were given free olive oil, extra virgin, and you would eat a quarter of a cup a day. Seems like a lot, but if you're Italian or married into an Italian family like me, it's easy. You just put on everything. You saute everything or braise and add it instead of butter. Really easy, it's not just on salad. And then the other 2,500 were given free nuts. They were given up basically an ounce a day. You go to Trader Joe's, those little packets are about an ounce. What was in the, what nuts? Half of them were walnuts because they wanted people to have more omega-3s in their diet. And the other two were almonds and filberts, also known as hazelnuts, very popular in Europe. They're all good nuts. In fact, all nuts are good for you. Um, <clears throat> and they found, regardless of which type of um, free food you got, people ate it, and they all did better with their heart, uh, lower heart attack rates and um, lower stroke rates, and they also did better with their thinking. But the, it's important to know that everybody was eating more fish and more beans or legumes, uh, another meal or half a meal a week. Um, so that made a difference. And what they were able to tease out is the olive oil improved your executive function or your ability to organize, and the nuts improved your memory. So you need both of them. And then, okay, now what's, how do we know what's going on inside the brain when we eat different. Okay, so then we have a study from Australia. You see why this is an international effort. Uh, the U.S. isn't doing a whole lot, but our, our colleagues around the world are doing great work. So this young lady, um, she's just a postdoc, had the idea of teaming up with one of these cohort studies where they're interviewing what people are eating. And by now, we, we have brain imaging where we can um, image people's brains, any of us, you know, probably cost a thousand or two thousand dollars. We can have our brains image on what's called a PET scan to see much how much of this A beta protein has been building up in your brain. If you're a part of the A4 study, they do that as part of seeing whether you're eligible for the study. You've got to have a buildup to be eligible for that. That's a prevention study. Well, what they wanted to do was see. If what you ate had anything to do with how much A-beta is building up in your brain at baseline and every year for three years, how fast is it increasing? And what they were able to find out is, and again, they used the Mediterranean diet point system because they had Nick Scarmaeus, that Greek doctor. Uh, he's very good looking, by the way. <laughs> Always sort of like him. Um, but anyway, they um, wanted to, they had him as a co-investigator so they could use his system. And again, in Australia, not that many people are from the Mediterranean, but it worked out very well. They found out people who scored the, the six to nine on the Mediterranean diet had the lowest rates of A beta at baseline and slower rates of buildup over those three years. So this is our first proof that what you eat affects what's happening inside your brain. And of all the foods, individual foods, there was only one that was statistically significant, and it went in the opposite direction. So people who ate the most red meat had the fastest buildup. So um, it's just another indication that red meat is one of those toxic foods for the brain, and it doesn't matter whether it's grass-fed or whether it's pork, which is not the other white meat, it's the other red meat, lamb. And what we don't know is uh, nobody's really looked at wild meats to see if they have different constituents. But one of my friends who's into uh, what's happening in our gut, one of the reasons red meat is, is harmful to our brains apparently, when we eat more, too much red meat, it encourages the buildup of a problem bacteria, bad bacteria in our gut, which increases directly the buildup of the A beta in our brain. I mean, this is the latest area of research, is a connection with the health of our gut and the health of our brain, just like the rest of, the, of our body. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, I can't believe it's already 7 o'clock, but I think I started about 10 after, so we'll keep going. Um, now, the MIND diet, which I mentioned before, may be better than the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet for cognition. This was developed by Martha Claire Moore. She's our best, most famous an accomplished epidemiologist, that's the type of person that does these cohort studies in Chicago. 
And over the years, she's looked at individual nutrients one at a time, and then she decided, time to put it together. And she came up with her idea what was the most ideal diet based on her research and um, developed a point system for it. So she could apply it to uh, the same databases that other people have looked at, the MED diet and the DASH diet. And what she found out was that if people followed her style diet, they actually had even lower risk of getting Alzheimer's and lower risk of cognitive decline than uh, with the Mediterranean or DASH diet type uh, program. And again, this is not a clinical trial, but it was very interesting. And she used a lot of different independent studies, not just her own, uh, looking at the results for six or 7,000 people. Now, we were all in the field saying, she, need, she needs to be get a clinical trial. And it took a while to NIH uh, to get her funded, but we worked together to make it happen. And um, she got funded in the fall of 2016. And her, now again, she's an epidemiologist, not a clinical trial expert. So she teamed up with a guy that helped lead DASH clinical diet trials at Harvard. So that's why you see the trial going on both at, um, in Massachusetts and in Chicago, where she's from. Uh, I won't go into the details, but um, the question she'll be answering is, will, will her program, if they can get people to follow it, and it's going to be a, a five-year uh, trial, um, will it help lower their risk of getting Alzheimer's and cognitive decline? So stay tuned for that. And it will be the nutrition part of the Alzheimer's Association study. Um, they were one of those that have been helping support Martha's work. I think she's got several grants from the association. And why not use a homegrown um, nutrition program that's very promising? And because a clinical trial is underway, they've already worked out the kinks of, OK, how do we implement this? Uh, it's, it's a, a theoretical diet, how do we make it work with recipes and menus? They will have already developed that for the, her clinical trial. Now meanwhile, just when you're thinking, well, it's the MIND diet, there's the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet. Well, in the summer, um, there was a report that the Nordic diet also looks even better than the MIND or Mediterranean for Swedish people. Because I used the Swedish database. Again, they used a point system. And they found out that for Swedes, it was better if they followed what they call the Nordic prudent dietary pattern. That's the one that they used in the, fin the finger trial. And it's a little different than the Mediterranean or um, mind diet. It's eating more non-root vegetables. Well, we all agree that leafy greens are great. But this would mean trying to avoid having too many, not just potatoes, but all root vegetables which other people are not worried about. Certain fruits, they emphasize pears, apples, and peaches. And you'll see that others, like uh, Martha Claire Morris, emphasizes berries, doesn't even mention these other fruits. Fish and poultry, and instead of olive oil, which is not so easily available up <coughs> north, you know, they emphasize canola oil, which is full of omega-3s, along with the monounsaturated fatty acids that are in olive oil. Tea, water, and wine. And then eating less root vegetables, refined grains and cereals. We all agree on um, no, you know, avoiding processed grains. Uh, <coughs> less butter and margarine. We all agree on less sugar sweets and pastries and fruit juice. And so the conclusion is there are many brain healthy diets. And what, what we find is that they all rely on traditional whole foods. This is what they have in common. And minimize processed and sugary foods and they emphasize nutrient-rich foods, because you can only eat so many calories. And um, I, I, um, I'm close on time, so I won't go into all of the slides I have for you comparing the different programs. But if you want more information, you can contact me. But let's go over um, some of them. The key is, um, I, I have to say, mine, mine has not been tested in any of these cohort studies. I personally believe it might outdo all the rest because it's based on a broader database, but we don't know. And uh, this shows you a little bit of you know, how they compare. Some, sometimes diets look at um, types of food. I'm looking at, based on the research, the elements in the foods, like lots of antioxidants. That's not mentioned in the other diets. 
lowering inflammation is a major strategy. It's, it's not mentioned in the other diets, but some of the foods that they choose would help lower inflammation. None of them mention um, uh, the, the import, well, some of them mention the importance of more omega-3s, but most of them don't mention the importance of lowering the amount of omega-6s, except for um, uh, Dr. Scarmaeus' work. And then, very important to control LDL cholesterol, um, it's silent, in, uh, it's not mentioned with the other diets. Um, and the way to do it is by limiting sugar and eating foods that lower cholesterol. Uh, leafy greens, I think we, both Martha Claire and Morris and I really emphasize that of all your vegetables, the leafy greens, and we don't know all the reasons why, are your most important ones. They're full of omega-3s, B vitamins, and also vitamin E. Every time in nature you find an omega-3, which is what our brains are made out of, a uh, good part of them, uh, nature gives you vitamin E to protect your the omega-3s from oxidizing. It's kind of complicated biochemistry, but luckily um, that's the way the world is. And um, some of them don't mention um, leafy greens, but they all mention the importance of vegetables of one type or another. And you heard the Nordic diet emphasizes the non-root vegetables, whereas you'll see there's a consideration why you want some root vegetables to make sure you're getting enough um, prebiotics. Okay, fruits, uh, I emphasize three to five a day, whole fruits and limiting juices. The reason is, even though juices have wonderful nutrients in them, they, are, they don't have the fiber to slow down the absorption of the sugar. So it's not that juices are bad for you, it's just it would be so much better for you to eat an apple or the whole fruit, and, um, or a puree that has the fiber in it. So I say limit juices to about four to six ounces a day. Um, the MIND diet is silent about fruits except saying have a half a cup of berries every day. I wouldn't disagree with that, but other fruits have other benefits, which the Nordic diet emphasizes, and what we found in Massachusetts, apples actually boost the amount of acetylcholine, the memory neurotransmitter in your brain that Aricet helps increase. So we're, I think we'll find that you know each food has its own special qualities, and so I emphasize eating a variety. But berries, uh, yes, please eat lots of berries. And then the others emphasize eating lots of fruit but doesn't single out the berries. Um, and spices and herbs, I think the reason no other diet emphasizes that is because if you're interviewing people, how do you figure out how much cinnamon they ate or how much oregano or saffron or other particular spices? They're in such small quantities. But uh, my emphasis on that is based on all the, my studies and these clinical trials that I uh, shared with you. So spices and herbs, and that's one of the easiest changes you could make. Sweets and sugar, um, it's very important to limit the amount of sugar. And um, while Nick Scarmaeus did not include a point related to sugar, if you look at a typical Mediterranean diet, very, very few um, sweets in the traditional way. Like, uh, I, as I said, my in-laws, they were Sicilian. And they would have a dessert at most once a week. That was it. Your fruit that you finished the meal was was fruit. Uh, you did not, that was your dessert. That was your natural sweet. That was the best dessert. And it helped with your digestion, too. So a lot of traditional diets, I noticed a lot of Asians, traditionally, they will end the meal with fruit. So um, you really need to cut way back on your, on your sweets. That's something we all agree on, even if it wasn't part of somebody's formal nutritional program. The newest area, and, the, and this is because the others are silent on it because it's a newer area of nutrition, is the need to eat probiotics and prebiotics. Now what are those? Those are big terms. Some of you have heard of them. The probiotics means that the healthy bacteria that live in our guts. We, we are living zoos and we have thousands and probably millions of living organisms in us, in our gut. And what we're learning is having a healthy gut and having healthy bacteria as opposed to poisonous uh, bacteria um, developing toxins inside us is really critical to our heart health and uh, lots of areas of our health, our immune system, how easily we catch a cold, as well as our brain health. 
And then if you got all this zoo in you, well, you got to feed them. And that's the prebiotics. And the prebiotics are things like onions, leeks, anything in the garlic family, onion family, um, all the fibers that are in some of these tree fruits. There aren't so many in the berries. And uh, also fibers that are in beans and nuts. We think that's why beans come out as being a star in every uh, program for the heart or diabetes as well as the brain, as well as um, uh, your whole grains, that covering that is removed, um, or is full of fiber. It's removed when you refine a grain. So there are lots of fibers in you, in your traditional uh, diet from any, any uh, country or ethnic group. So nuts are emphasized in all of these um, other diets except for the DASH diet, lump nuts, seeds, and beans together. Um, and you can see we should be eating them quite frequently, not just once a week. Um, I'm probably uh, the biggest um, emphasis on those, the nuts and seeds and the beans. And even my little granddaughter, she was started on a brain foods diet at uh, six months when, she, when it's okay for breastfed babies to start having solid foods. And my daughter wanted to feed her healthy, so I just added a few ideas, and the beans and lentils was one of them, and she loves them, and she's now two and a third uh, years old, and... Um, she, she uh, loves all these healthy foods, so stay tuned for brain foods for babies someday in my future. Um, I have a new granddaughter who's just three months, so I get to start babysitting for her in a few um, weeks, actually. So fats and oils, uh, very important. Um, this is emphasized in some of the nutritional programs. Um, I and uh, um, Mediterranean and the MIND diet emphasize olive oil, but you heard the Nordic diet um, emphasizes canola oil, which is another good oil. I emphasize fish oil, flax, a little bit of coconut oil, um, and, um, and kind of mixing it up. But trying to avoid altogether trans fats. Um, Martha Claire Morris's MIND diet says maximum amount of butter is one tablespoon a day and limit the amount of cheese and dairy that you take in if it's high fat. And then um, some of the other diets emphasize uh, vegetables of all kinds. Uh, as I said, the MIND diet just emphasizes the uh, uh, leafy greens. Uh, most of the others are silent about red, how much um, they might say lean meats, the DASH diet. The Mediterranean diet says less meats than other animal foods. And um, the MIND diet doesn't mention exactly how to limit the intake, but does mention it. And I um, am recommending to you that you have red meat less than once a week, or even no more than once a month. And the key thing for um, me is also avoiding the processed meats with the nitrates, because they aggravate the problem of insulin resistance in your brain, along with sugar. And um, the other programs didn't mention that because, again, they're based on um, data that doesn't look at nitrates. Poultry, um, two to four times a week. It's actually a pretty safe uh, animal food. And eggs, um, the others are silent about eggs, but eggs are actually a brain food. And the key, we've now, uh, a lot of people were scared off of them because of the high cholesterol levels in the egg yolk. Well, it turns out um, some of my other slides would show is that eating cholesterol has nothing to do with whether it raises the, your cholesterol level, unless you're in a very unusual kind of uh, by, uh, genetic situation. Actually, it's been shown that in um, at UMass Medical Center, if you ate two omega-3 uh, or free-range eggs a day, you would actually lower your cholesterol levels. So eggs um, is a way of getting some uh, animal protein, and especially the yolks are very healthy uh, without um, a lot of expense. And then dairy, we need to generally limit how much we have and keep it low fat. Uh, <clears throat> so I also emphasize vitamins such as B, D, E, and C are the most important for the brain. And again, because of the way they were developed, the other nutrition programs don't particularly mention um, vitamins or supplements. Um, I'm uh, 
I think I'll end up uh, with this slide because uh, we're, we're out of time and I know that you have lots of questions. So we have the Mediterranean diet, the MIND diet. Uh, there will be additional trials and studies. Uh, the Nordic diet was um, talked about, but it hasn't been studied all by itself. So look for that. I would love to see a trial of the African heritage diet. I've got a picture of it here. And probably it's not going to happen because it's not thought about that much. But the reason I like it um, is that traditionally you would have lots of leafy greens every day. You can see the bottom of the pyramid. That's all leafy greens. And all the other fruits and vegetables are in the next layer. And then they have a whole emphasis on herbs and spices and sauces. And then fish and shellfish. And then a little bit of other kinds of uh, meats and poultry, a little bit of dairy, and again, like all of them, the amount of sweets is um, very little. And um, I think there's going to be a lot more research on the toxicity of sugar. And um, let's see if I could just fast forward to that slide, because if there's nothing else you go away with is um, that you don't want to have too much sugar. We know a lot of the effects of sugar on the rest of our body. You might not know it increases inflammation. If you've got any kind of joint issues, you eat a lot of sugar, you're going to hurt. Most people don't realize that. But it's, it's actually toxic to the brain. Uh, Suzanne Kraft um, taught us some of this, but the animal studies show the same thing. It increases directly the insulin resistance in our brain. Did you know your brain makes Insulin, uh, it has its own insulin supply. De Dr. Delamonte pointed that out. And it challenges our blood sugar metabolism in the brain and the body. But because it's so inflammatory, it's one of the most inflammatory foods we can eat is sugar. Or eating too many carbs that the body converts to sugar. Very inflammatory. So not only does it make your joints ache, it speeds up the, the um, decline of your brain and it increases the amount of A-beta building up in your brain and also of tau. Um, and then, separately, it speeds up the rate of Alzheimer's, um, uh, de your decline from Alzheimer's should you already have it. It, shrink it ab absolutely shrinks your hippocampus. This was proven by a different doctor doing imaging studies at NYU, Dr. Convit, even in teenagers that are developing prediabetes and diabetes. And luckily, you know, our brain, we're born with extra brain cells so we can lose a lot and still be cognitively normal. But you get to a certain point, you're no longer normal. And then the excess sugar um, from the clinical trials in mice and humans, I already mentioned, um, in induces memory deficits and increases your A beta problems. And on top of that, it causes your, it's the main thing that causes your body to make the bad kind of cholesterol that when oxidized um, creates the arthrosclerosis and the problems in your blood vessels. So you really, sugar is endemic in our society. The amount that is built up, um, it was normal to eat about a teaspoon and a half a day in the early 1900s. And now it's, we're eating 47 teaspoons a day. So do the math. It's uh, a lot of times more, more sugar, and we shouldn't be surprised it hurts our bodies and our brains. So one tablespoon in the 1900s, and now how many? 47. Yeah. Teaspoons or tablespoons? Teaspoons. Teaspoons. Now in one one big can of soda, you've got 20. You've got you know. 20, you've got a lot of teaspoons. And as a, as a uh, woman, you're supposed to have only six a day, but this is to protect your heart. And a man, eight to nine. And um, the amount of added sugar in, in a, one can of Coke, say, would be, you'd be way over your limit for the day. The principles of the MPN are first of all, and this is shared by many of the other programs I've just outlined, is use whole foods, not processed. Minimize your use of processed foods with all the additives that we've learned uh, can, can harm us, when, especially when eaten in excess. We need to eat more plant foods and fewer animal foods in general. You don't have to be vegan, but you really do need to increase your plant food intake. 
uh, compared to what most Americans are eating. You want to eat fish or seafood a minimum of three times a week. And you want to reduce all forms of sugar and refined carbs. Desserts you should limit to no more than three times a week and consider uh, fruit instead of a sweet dessert. Avoid trans fats and high fructose corn syrups. Read the food labels. That's the only way to do that efficiently. And then you want to be eating a lot more spices, leafy greens, nuts, seeds, omega-3s, whole grains every day, beans, legumes, and lentils several times a week, and a greater variety of foods in moderation. One of the reasons for that is we still don't know all the different foods our body and brain need, and it's also one way to avoid intaking too much of any one poison, um, toxic um, pesticide or other toxins found in modern foods. You want to consider consuming three meals with one or two snacks a day. Drink up with hydrating with water, herbal teas. If you do drink fruit juice, no more than four to six ounces a day. And then there are certain supplements that I'll go into. You also should consider fasting 12 to 14 hours between dinner and breakfast. This is recommended by Dr. Richard Isaacson. Um, MD of Wheel Cornell Medical College in New York City. He has um, many reasons for that, and I um, endorse his recommendations, especially for people who already been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. It helps your brain use uh, ketones and fats instead of uh, sugar, and it's a, it's a very good practice for everyone. <clears throat> Now, the seven strategies, of the MPN, I'll first outline them, and then I'll go into a little detail on each one. The seven strategies are, first, increase the amount and variety of antioxidants, reduce insulin resistance, reduce LDL cholesterol, and avoid trans fats, reduce your overall sugar intake, increase omega-3s and other healthy fats, decreasing unhealthy fats, reduce inflammation, very critical since inflammation not only puts you at greater risk of Alzheimer's disease and other brain diseases and many other diseases of the body, but also speeds up the your decline if you already have Alzheimer's disease going on. And, and the same is true for other diseases, many other diseases that have an inflammation factor. Also, in, be sure that you get adequate B, C, D, and E vitamins and eat probiotics and prebiotics. That's my newest strategy, which I just added in t- earlier in 2017. Now I'm going to go into detail on each of these. First, increase the amount and variety of antioxidants. This is absolutely key to brain health and it um, relates to many of the other strategies, including decreasing inflammation and improving your sugar metabolism. Oxidative stress plays a major role in brain cell deterioration, Alzheimer pathology, dementia symptoms, and risk. Every antioxidant-rich food tested in Alzheimer mice led to better thinking and reduced beta amyloid in the brain. And to pre- we want to do this also to prevent oxidation of DNA and delicate omega-3s that are so vital to brain health. We also want, to, in order to do this, we need to prioritize plants because they are the biggest, most varied source of antioxidants. Though you'll find some antioxidants in the orange color of salmon, for example. Now, I'll list some of the foods that are really key here. Spices are number one. Um, they are the stars. They're potent antioxidants in small volumes. They're also mostly anti-inflammatory. Then there are vegetables. They're much more important than your fruits. And uh, among the vegetables, especially leafy greens. Then there are beans. Among the fruits, the best are the berries for many reasons. Um, nuts, seeds, whole grains, tea, juice, a vegetable and fruit and foods rich in natural vitamin E. Antioxidants facilitate all the strategies, as I mentioned earlier, and prevent oxidation of LDL cholesterol, which is when um, it gets you into trouble, is when it's oxidized. I'll touch on that again a little bit later. And one reason the berries are the most potent among the fruits is that they're nutrient-dense, they're anti-inflammatory, they promote brain cell signaling. 
but you don't want to ignore the other fruits because they also do um, important things. Apples increase memory neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and some of the other fruits help you with the area of prebiotics that I'm going to be discussing later. Next, we want to explore the strategy number two, reducing insulin resistance. Insulin resistance puts your brain at greater risk of not just diabetes, but Alzheimer's disease. It increases the amount of beta amyloid building up your brain and will increase the rate of decline should you have one of these uh, diseases. Now, to do this, you, you also are improving your sugar metabolism. And overall, you want to minimize sugar, refined carbohydrates, which your body converts to sugar, and starches. You want to reduce sweetened drinks and cereals. And if you do drink fruit juice, limit it to four to six ounces and make sure it's 100% fruit juice. And then you want to emphasize instead complex carbs, such as whole grains and beans and nuts. And then you want green tea and spices such as cinnamon and turmeric and others that help reduce your, help your improve your blood sugar. I wanted to emphasize that excess sugar is toxic to the brain. Here are some of the ways it does. It increases insulin resistance inside our brains. Our brains live on sugar and it, it's a very delicate balance and the brain really doesn't like it when we eat too much sugar, especially in, in large amounts uh, all at once. It challenges the overall blood sugar metabolism in the brain and body. And then the other way it um, des helps destroy our brains is that it's highly pro-inflammatory. It speeds up cognitive decline in the rate of Alzheimer's disease. And what's very scary, it, it directly shrinks the hippocampus, the seat of our short-term memory and empathy. Even in teenagers, uh, Dr. Convit at NYU did a lot of research on this in the last decade. Excess sugar induces in both Alzheimer mice and in humans, separate trials of course, memory deficits directly, as well as increased A-beta problems and abnormal LDL cholesterol, which I'll get to in a minute. Those are two um, very dangerous direct uh, uh, results of eating too much sugar. And so in order to accomplish this, you, as I said before, you want to eat less of certain foods, your refined carbs, your sugars, and your processed foods. You want to avoid nitrates, and they're heavily in processed meats because nitrates increase insulin resistance in your brain and body. You want to eat more of the foods that regulate blood sugar. Cinnamon, I recommend one teaspoon a day. Spices, green tea, beans and lentils, nuts and seeds, fish and seafood, green vegetables, whole grains, and this is some happy news for chocolate lovers. If you eat dark chocolate that is 70% cocoa solids, you can enjoy up to 1.6 ounces a day and actually be helping your blood sugar and as well as the rest of your body and brain and for other um there are many good mechanisms of dark chocolate because that the cocoa solids are such a powerful antioxidant. They're as powerful as the spices I've been talking about. Strategy three is reducing LDL cholesterol, and I give you some ideas of how. Um, it's eating certain foods, but it's also avoiding others. The latest research is that it's not eating cholesterol itself, that causes human bodies to make excess cholesterol. It's much more complicated than that. So even um, the USDA is taking, uh, will eventually eliminate cholesterol information on labels because it's irrelevant. So you can eat omega-3 eggs and enjoy them. They're brain foods. You want free range eggs, they're the best. Free range or eggs that have had um, omega-3s added by giving um, the chickens omega-3s in their feed. It's unclear how, as yet how much saturated fat is okay for the heart or brain and whether it might increase cholesterol. In any case, we need to continue limiting saturated fat to 10% of calories for brain health. The main problem that leads to too much LDL cholesterol of the bad type is eating too much sugar 
and the carbs, which body converts to sugar, that is your refined carbs. The liver converts all X sugar to very fine particle, that's uh, abbreviated as VF, LDL cholesterol, and fat. It's a survival mechanism from ancient times to save we humans from starvation. It's really a brilliant operation of the body. And you could imagine our cave uh, people ancestors did not eat a lot of sugar. The only sugar they got was in whole foods, such as your root vegetables or from fruit. And those foods were loaded with other good elements um, in addition to a, a modest amount of sugar. Now we eat 45 times too much sugar. So it's upsetting this whole um, way that our body operates um, when it gets too much sugar. It's no longer acting as a starvation protection, but leads to all sorts of health problems, not just obesity. Thus, for eating excess sugar causes our liver to make too much of the very fine particle LDL that when oxidized and only when oxidized creates the sticky plaque that sticks to the inside of our blood vessels in our brain as well as body. So you can see that that's going to put you at greater risk for stroke and heart disease, but it also directly affects your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Now, the wonderful thing is that there are so many great delicious foods that help your body decrease cholesterol. Um, so first of all, try non-sugar sweeteners. You can ask me more about that. Follow s strategy number two, because everything you do to reduce your insulin resistance and improve sugar metabolism will help you reduce your LDL cholesterol. And then the foods that help both strategies are nuts, beans, oatmeal, grapefruit, niacin, fiber, fish, fish and fish oil, olive oil, cruciferous vegetables, that's like broccoli and bok choy, leafy green and cabbage, leafy greens, colored root vegetables, yogurt and probiotics, certain spices and antioxidants. It's very interesting, but you shouldn't be surprised now to hear that the same spices that improve your blood sugar, also reduce your cholesterol. There's an intimate relationship. The other thing you want to do in terms of your, your health related to fats is to avoid trans fats altogether, partially hydrogenated oils that are found in many processed and packaged foods. That's an, one of the many reasons to avoid processed foods. And you also need to reduce the amount of animal foods and animal fats that you consume that relates to multiple ways of wrecking havoc with your brain. Strategy four is to increase our intake of omega-3s and other healthy fats. I'm going to go into more details of the healthy fats. And in general, um, <clears throat> the strategy is to, if you eat, focus on eating more of the delicious foods that are healthy fats, then you're automatically eat less of and fewer fats that are not so good for you. I want to, before moving on to the healthy fats, I want to mention besides the trans fats which you were to avoid altogether if you can and to limit your saturated fats to about a quarter to a sixth of your total fat intake. The American Heart Association recommends about 13 grams a day as your upper limit. And, um, but the other fat that you need to, to reduce is omega-6s. That's not, you won't find that mentioned so much by the American Heart Association, but it's very, very important to brain health as well as actually overall body health. Omega-6s are mostly found in animal foods and many oils, including some vegetable oils. The reason we want to limit them is that they're very pro-inflammatory and remember, Anti-inflammation is one of the overall most important strategies of, of your nutrition program to maintain a healthy brain. Omega-6s can be more unhealthy than eating too many saturated fats. I'm in the camp of the people that are concerned about if we focus only on limiting saturated fats, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. You want to increase omega-3s, which are 
anti-inflammatory, that is reduce inflammation, and at the same time limit your consumption of omega-6s because our goal is to achieve an overall ratio of one part omega-3 to four parts omega-6s. And in the U.S. today, the actual ratio for most people is 1 to 30, which is way, way out of whack, and it's very pro-inflammatory. So let's go on to discuss what are omega-3s and where can we find them, and then what are um, monounsaturated fats and where can what foods can we find them. Okay, uh, slide 55. We can increase, the reason we want to increase omega-3s is not just because they are anti-inflammatory, but they're an actual essential part, component of all brain cells and the connections between them are the nerves as well as our nerves. Um, It may also reduce the risk of depression and mood disorders, and they're generally deficient in the American diet. That's why you have to work at increasing them. Well, where do we find them? Foods rich in omega-3s include fish, shellfish, seafood, kelp, dulse, and kombu. If you are a vegan, then you really need to focus on eating more seaweed, kelp, and the um, non-animal sources below. Eggs that are free-range and omega-3 enriched are the best. Green leafy vegetables are full of omega-3s, and purslane is a vegetable that is actually treated as a weed, but is one of the richest sources and eaten um, in other countries and treated as a weed in the U.S. Well, sometimes we get things backwards, just like dandelions are one of the healthiest leafy greens that you can eat. Canola oil is also a good source of omega-3s, and it's less expensive than some other oils that I'll be recommending. And there are certain nuts and seeds that are very good sources of omega-3s. It's not in all nuts and seeds, but it's in walnuts, chia seeds, flax seeds, and hemp seeds. Modest amounts, believe it or not, in raspberries and cauliflower. Now, monounsaturated fats... They're another, the other healthy fat, and we find them mostly in plant-based foods such as olive oil and olives, canola oil. Canola oil, you know, has got two great healthy oils in it, both omega-3s and monounsaturated. It's kind of unique that way. Uh, almonds and other nuts, peanuts, 100% natural peanut butter, avocados, and many seeds. Now, While some oils other than canola oil might have omega-3s and monounsaturated, I don't recommend them because they have even more omega-6s in the mix. So one of your strategies is to use olive oil and canola oil for almost all of your cooking and salad needs and not use other oils except specialty oils for flavor, such as a little bit of sesame seed oil or peanut oil and other things that you use for flavor. Next is strategy number five, cooling inflammation. Here, everything I I will remark on, you've heard before related to one of the other strategies for the most part. We want to eat less of the very pro-inflammatory sugar and refined carbs. We want to eat less animal foods, especially red meat, and we want to eat fewer omega-6s. What we want to eat more of are fish and seafood, plant foods of all kinds, especially vegetables, nuts and seeds, green tea, berries among the fruits, spices and herbs, and especially spices and herbs, they're delicious. They'll help you eat less sugar and salt, and they will be doing amazing things for your body and brain. Among the most anti-inflammatory herbs and spices are turmeric, ginger, rosemary, oregano, holy basil, cinnamon, and hot peppers. I love this. The hotter the pepper, the more it cools us on the inside. And if you don't If you can't stand or don't enjoy hot peppers, don't worry. There are all those other ways to reduce inflammation in your body and brain. Strategy six is to make sure you get the important vitamins for your brain. Vitamins B, C, D, and E. 
Vitamin B slows brain atrophy and cognitive and emotional decline. We need a whole bunch of the different vitamin Bs. And the best choice is a B50 complex to avoid imbalances and you want to avoid excess B6. You want especially B12 and niacin. And the synthetic um, B vitamins found in enriched grains and in the vitamins we buy work very well as we age because we can't, for some reason, absorb B vitamins from our food as well as we used to. So that's why it's very important to supplement. Now, the other vitamins that I'm recommending, you want to have the natural form, not the synthetic form. Vitamin D helps prevent cognitive and emotional decline. You're going to feel um, brighter and happier when you have sufficient vitamin D. I recommend that you all ask your doctors once a year to get you tested for both vitamin D and B12. And most people in the Northeast are deficient in vitamin D. It seems to um, increase as a problem as we age, but also if we have darker skin, we're at greater risk. Vitamin D enriched foods are insufficient. You must take a supplement. I personally take 4,000 to 6,000 international units every day. That's what I personally need to have blood levels that are sufficient. Other people might need a little less or a little more. 20 minutes of sun a day usually is enough for people, but again, in the winter time, we don't get that here in the Northeast. We, um, so I recommend that you take a vitamin D supplement and or cod liver oil. Cod liver oil, the reason it was given to so many children in earlier days was for the vitamin D content. The parents and grandparents didn't realize they were also giving them omega-3s and helping their children in be bright um, in school as well as to have fewer colds. I personally take a tablespoon of vitamin D, I mean of cod liver oil every day, plus, as I mentioned, the vitamin D supplements. Vitamin E, what you want for your brain health is the complex forms with four tocopherols and four tocotrienols. You do not want either the synthetic vitamin E or just alpha tocopherol. That's actually counterproductive. And you don't need, when you get the correct form, you don't need very much of it. 200 international units um, a day is really enough, or you could alternate the four, they usually comes in 400 international units and you can alternate you can contact me if you want some good sources of this very complex form. Um, vitamin E is part of our actual brain cell membrane. It protects the delicate omega-3s inside the brain from oxidizing. And ideally, each of our brain cells would have multiple molecules of vitamin E and not the alpha tocopherol so much as the, as the gamma and other forms. And no one food, unfortunately, has all eight forms. I call it a family. So you need nuts, seeds, palm oil, leafy greens, and a whole variety of foods if you're trying to get it all from food. That's why a supplement is so much easier. Vitamin C is good in itself, but it also helps vitamin E do its job in the brain. The seventh strategy, which I just added earlier this year in, in 2017, is that gut health is key, and that means we need to eat both probiotics and prebiotics. In the next couple of slides, we'll explain what, what these foods are. You've probably been hearing more and more about the importance of the microbiome. That's a fancy scientific uh, name for our gut and what kinds of foods we need to eat. Um, science is new in this area in nutrition and in brain science, and so there's a lot we still don't know, but I'll share with you some of the key things we do know. Mo probiotics are healthy bacteria, and we want to have a variety and as many of them, um, lots of them, billions, in fact, in our gut. Um, most, here's some examples of the type of foods that you want to consider eating more of. Most pickled and fermented vegetables such as sauerkraut, dill, and other cucumber pickles. Hey, aren't they great? Kimchi and assorted pickled veg vegetables that um, you'll see in many different cultures feature fermented 
fruits and vegetables of different kinds. Then vinegars, especially if they're still alive, such as Brog's apple cider vinegar, all vinegars from various fruits, including cider vinegar, balsamic vinegar. You want to limit, however, the use of rice vinegar because of the high sugar content. Kombucha and other fermented non-dairy drinks, they're great. Fermented dairy, this is what we think of most, but you want to kind of mix it up. And then, of course, if you're vegan, uh, you wouldn't be able to use any of these. But here are some of our favorite fermented dairy. Yogurt, and then use Greek yogurt um, because it has much higher protein content, but also four different probiotics as opposed to one in the more usual yogurt. Buttermilk, that's an older uh, form of fermented dairy, but it's really quite quite good. Some people love it, some don't, some just use it in cooking. But when you cook with yogurt and buttermilk, I believe that most of the fermentation benefit disappears. Cottage cheese, that's pretty popular with a lot of folks. Regolta um, and limited amounts of full fat cheeses. You want to avoid processed cheeses and cheese foods. They're not good for us at all. But some of the full fat traditional cheeses um, are have many good benefits for us. You just want to eat a limited amounts. Um, think of your saturated fat limit for the day. And then in um, a vegan product, which many people like, would be soy products. Um, even soy sauce is a fermented soy product, as is miso soup and tempeh, but not for some reason tofu. It's made a different way. And then you have, of course, your alcoholic drinks such as beers, wines, and especially red wine is very good for our brains, but in moderation. And if you have alcohol problems, you just avoid that that category altogether. And no matter how much it might benefit others, it's not going to be good for you. Okay, moving right along. What are prebiotics? Well, if we got these living, living creatures inside our gut... Guess what? They have to eat. We have to feed them. Um, They can't get their own food except for what we eat. Prebiotics are food for the good, healthy bacteria. They're generally soluble and some insoluble, so-called indigestible fiber that the probiotic bacteria use for food. These fibers are often sweet-tasting ones that the probiotic bacteria ferments and turns into its own edible food. And I'm wondering sometimes if the actual fermentation process that goes on on inside our gut is part of what keeps us healthy. Um, Again, we're still learning so much about this. Examples of the fibers that are good bacteria like to eat are certain polysaccharides such as inulin, Pectin, which is found in many fruits, inulin is uh, found in certain vegetables, uh, leafy greens such as dandelions and uh, Jerusalem artichoke and many others. And then there's certain fructo oligosaccharides and other type foods uh, that are, um, you know, good for us to eat. So we're feeding our gut. Also, certain resistant starches which pass to the large intestine undigested, such as found in sorghum. And sorghum, I do want to recommend that it's a being rediscovered because it's gluten-free for those that have to worry about that. Most of us don't. And sorghum is naturally sweet tasting and it's loaded with antioxidants. It's an amazing grain, ancient grain that should come back into popularity for all its good uses. You can even pop it like popcorn. Certain prebiotics enhance the good bacteria's ability to produce an anti-inflammatory substance called butyrate, which further reduces inflammation in the gut and elsewhere in our body. So this is really fascinating um, information, and stay tuned. Now we're going to go on to comparing brain-healthy diets. Over the years of working with my clients, I've learned that People want practical advice. You've heard all these details about research and what foods are we're supposed to eat more of or less of. But what? how can we summarize that as goals for brain-healthy eating on a daily, weekly basis? So um, this slide summarizes that for you, and many of you had it as a take-home take, take home, um, handout. 
and you can find it eventually on my website, brainwellness.com. Daily, you want to eat your healthy fats, omega-3s and monounsaturated, the others I mentioned. Spices and herbs daily, probiotics and prebiotics daily. Yes, you can take a supplement, but try to get as much as you can from your foods for the probiotics. The prebiotics is food, so you that's the only way you can do that. And then, very important, vegetables, leafy greens, and fruit, you need to eat multiple times a day, not just once a day. So you want your vegetables ideally five to seven helpings a day and vary them so that you have mostly leafy greens, but you also have some root vegetables in all parts of the of the plant, um, such as peppers, tomatoes. And then leafy greens, you want one, one to three times a day. I do that myself. I happen to love them. If you don't like your leafy greens so well, Try adding flavors such as balsamic vinegar, mustard, other flavors that you like. That's what my son-in-law does to make them, make them more enjoyable. Some people only eat raw, but you can eat more volume if you cook them and eat a variety. And then fruit, especially berries, you should have several times a day. Juice, as I said, limit to four to six ounces a day or skip it all together because whole fruits are better. You get some of the fiber that you need uh, as your prebiotics, but it also slows down the absorption of the sugar that's naturally in fruit so that it's better for you overall. Then whole grains, I don't specify how much to eat a day. Some eat a lot, some eat hardly any, but what I emphasize is it should be 70% of all the grains that you eat and in any given day should be whole. And do think about experimenting with some of the ancient grains that are so rich in antioxidants, such as teff and sorghum and others. Um, Fish and seafood, eat three to five times a week. Poultry, two to four times a week. You've got to eat some kind of protein. So a lot of people there eat beans and lentils as a way of reducing their overall animal food intake. Eggs, you can eat up to five times a week, probably even seven if you like an egg every morning. Go for it, but do make them free-range or omega-3 eggs. And then red meat, this is where you want to limit it to one, one time or less a week or a month even. And red meat includes pork, not just um, the more obvious beef and lamb. Nuts and seeds, you should try to have at least five times a week, and the same with your beans and lentils. And then um, the bottom of the slide shows that you need to limit your added sugar to, for women, five or six teaspoons a, a day, and men, eight to nine. And you probably can go even less than that if you really want to protect your brain. Okay, so where do you start? That's that's a long list of things to worry about. So you can't do it all at once. These changes take time. Some are fun. You can start working on the spices right away. They're fun and easy to do. So um, where else to start is to start with dessert. Since that's the most dangerous, you want to really work at reducing your sugar intake. Use fruit instead. Smaller portions is another strategy and less often. You don't have to give up your favorites. Just have them smaller amounts and less, way less often if you're eating a lot right now. Snacks, think about more savory nuts and using nuts and seeds, carrots and veggie sticks and avocado and less of the refined carbs and sweets. Think about water instead of soda. Salad dressing such as extra virgin olive oil and vinegar, mix spices, make your own. That um, is one way, but you, if you do purchase them, try to get the more um, pure um, ingredient type salad dressings. And avoid the ones that say they're fat free because of course they load them up with sugar and that's worse for you. Eat more veggies, such I already mentioned how you could do that to increase your flavor. Eat berries, nuts and seeds, whole grains. So like every week you could start with another strategy or another recommendation. That's one way to to do this. Um, I've had many people come back and tell me that over time they really made 
really great changes in their nutrition. Toxic foods use less and less often. So what are some additional steps you can take? You can make some menu changes. Some are easy for individuals. Increasing the use of spices and herbs. Reducing the amount and frequency of red meat. Make your own salad dressings. Try one new whole grain a week, like the taff and sorghum that I mentioned. And, of course, there's so many um, other delicious uh, grains out there. I hope that you're trying them and experimenting. Cook uh, large batches of beans and lentils once a week and use them for multiple meats, meals. Or you can buy cans of low-sodium beans or lentils, uh, add, eat them plain or add them to soups or salads. Select nuts as a snack. Sprinkle hemp seeds or flax seeds on your cereal um, or other foods or your salads. Make your own fruit yogurt cups because when you buy the yogurt with fruit in it, it's loaded with added sugar. I don't know if you realize that. And you might want to switch to coconut sugar, which has a lower glycemic index when you do use sugar, and also stevia products. My favorite is um, uses inulin as a as the main filler because inulin is a healthy fiber, as I just uh, mentioned. It's a prebiotic, and um, so that's a good product to think of. And it's called Sweet Leaf. Is that um, particular stevia product that? A lot of people like the taste. Um, there are others that are easier to find, and they're also okay. Use more avocado is another um, idea to think about. And as far as beans and lentils, by the way, you can start a six-month-old who's just starting on solid foods. They end up they naturally attracted to the sweet, slightly sweet taste of beans and lentils and will eat them quite eagerly. Uh, at least my granddaughters are can attest to that. They're still eating them and enjoying them every day for lunch and other parts of the meal. Brain foods and brain busters. Um, the, to summarize, there are hundreds of delicious foods that can help protect the brain and enhance brain power. There's combinations of foods such as the Mediterranean, Dash, Mine, Nordic, and MPN diets that are more potent than single brain foods. So keep that in mind. There are fewer but very prevalent foods that actively harm the brain, especially when eating in excess. Those are the ones we talked about tonight. Sugar, trans fats, nitrates, and refined carbs. Thus, it's important to increase the use of brain foods as well as decreasing the use of brain toxins. And then to sum it up, I love Michael Pollan's phrase, eat real food, mostly plants, not too much. If you remember nothing else of what I shared with you today think of michael pollan's words eat real food mostly plants not too much thank you so much for your attention and i enjoy talking with you tonight if you wish to learn more please visit my website brainwellness.com for recipes articles and more you can subscribe to my e-newsletter i don't send it out too often but when uh, new research results come up, I'd like to share it with everybody. And um, you can also, I'm really accessible. You may send me an email at nemerson at brainwellness.com or nemerson at bu.edu or just call, call my cell or send me a text at 978-621-1926. And thanks again for your attention. I really enjoyed our time t together and look forward to hearing from some of you in the future.